This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. We are back after our 167-hour hiatus. This is A Different Perspective, and I truly am Kevin Randall. For those of you who were expecting Peter Robbins tonight, he had a family emergency and uh, had to cancel that uh, cancel with us tonight. He will be on a future program. We have not actually arranged the dates yet, but we'll get something arranged and you'll all know when uh, that happens. I am joined instead by James Clarkson, and I'm going to ask him to give you a little bit more background about him, but he was recently the MUFON State Director for Washington. He was dishonorably, dishonorably, oh my God, he was honorably discharged from the Army in 1977, has lived in Washington State since 1987. This is what happens when you try to read something and it says honorably discharged and you get it all combobulated in your brain. Um, he has trained and worked as a police officer and a detective and served as a detective sergeant in a number of different capacities. And as I said, he has just resigned as the MUFON State Director. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. And, of course, he's had a lifelong commitment to exploring the UFO mystery. Uh, James Clarkson, welcome to A Different Perspective. Thank you sincerely, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I do appreciate the correction on the nature of my discharge from the Army. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's I mean, a major goof right there. Uh, we'll say again, honorably discharged. So it's absolutely clear that he was honorably, di you were honorably discharged. Um, the question I know that you always get, and I always get, and it's kind of a lame, mundane question, but what sucked you into the UFO phenomenon in the first place? Well, I wish that I could tell you that it was some profound experience. It's not. I'm a child of the 50s. I grew up on the day the earth stood still. My first major victory with my parents was getting to stay up late to watch the Twilight Zone. I've seen and read everything I could ever get from Rod Serling, Ray Bradbury. These are all the people I grew up with. And I think back, my mother was always, I don't think it was because of an experience, but for her, the space people as she called them, were a reality. And she said that someday we would meet them. And I've always just believed that. And I've always been intrigued by experiences that don't fit into our conventional definitions of reality. You know, what's interesting about that. When I'm asked that question, I always say my mother got me interested in it. And I explained that she took me to see the movie The uh, Earth versus the Flying Saucers when I was a little kid, and that kind of sparked my interest. And she had a big interest in science fiction, which, of course, is uh, space travel, alien civilizations, alien visitation. And it's not a big step into the UFO phenomenon from there. So your experiences with the day there stood still, mine with Earth versus the Flying Saucers, I mean, that is just really kind of a bizarre coincidence and how we all ended up in, the, in, this, in this place. Did Have you had any uh, UFO sightings yourself that were interesting? Remembering we just have a couple of seconds here left. I've, I've seen odd lights in the distance that I couldn't explain, but I would not go as far as saying that they were what I call a true UFO. 
And yeah, again, my experience is I had one experience with a light crossing the sky when I lived in Denver and um, it, it, it was just a light in the sky and I don't know what it was and it certainly doesn't suggest alien visitation to me at all. So kind of, we're kind of on the same plane here, so to speak. It gets a little stranger than that. If you went back and checked Earth versus the Flying Saucers, you would find that one of the stars was named Donald Curtis, who turns out to be a relative of my wife's. Oh, I thought you were going to say Hugh Marlowe was in, in, in uh, both films, but <laughs> no. Uh, there you go. Uh, we're going to have to take a quick break here. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk to you about MUFON. I want to talk about your uh, resignation from MUFON, how that came about, um, m maybe some of the things that you did with MUFON before your resignation. Try to put it in some kind of order so we can uh, produce an interesting program here. I will note that uh, for those of you interested, his web website is jamesclarksonufo.com. And I always put up additional information, sometimes not a whole lot, sometimes just links to other uh, websites that, that relate to the program at uh, my blog, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And given we just had the 70th anniversary of the Roswell thing, it's not too late to take a look at Roswell in the 21st century, and you all can see how that kind of fits into what you do. And be sure to take a look. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. And as I promised before we went away, I am still joined by James Clarkson. Um, he formerly the state's director for uh, Washington for the MUFON organization. And I will underscore once again, he was honorably discharged from the U.S. Army because that's really kind of a major catastrophe to suggest something other than that. Uh, when we went away, I kind of uh, foreshadowed what we're going to do, and I'm going to try to put it in more of a chronological order. So we know that, uh, uh, Jim, you were a member of the MUFON organization for a long time. Tell me how you got involved with MUFON. Well, actually, it started in the Army. I was at Fort Lewis, Washington as a plainclothes military policeman from 1974 to 1977. And I had 24-hour duty days, and one particular duty day, I was up talking to the desk sergeant, looked down at the top of his desk. There's a large piece of plexiglass next to the phone, numerous business cards, and one of them said, National UFO Reporting Center, 206 3000 So I thought that was a little unusual. I asked the desk sergeant, what is that? And he said, very matter of fact, he said, that's where we report UFOs. And we went on and had an interesting discussion about things that he had heard when he was in Europe, etc. But you got to flash forward from that would have been 1975 to about 1987. And after the famous Kenji Taroshi sighting, which I believe was late in 1986, the... Uh, Oh, you were going to you were going to explain it's the J J A L uh, what sixteen twenty eight flight, right? Exactly. Go ahead with that. 
that got me extremely interested. It was all over the news. I sent to the FAA. They sent me a press packet. I think I still have it in the file cabinet. I decided I didn't want to be on the sidelines anymore, so I recalled that phone number. I called it, and a man named Robert Gribble, a retired Seattle firefighter, answered the phone. And I said, I don't want to report a UFO. I want to know how I can get off the sidelines. And he said, have you ever heard of MUFON? And thereby hangs the tale. I ended up attending meetings in the Seattle area, which was a stretch because I was a full-time police officer, a young family man, and it's about 75 miles from where I was living then. I made it to a few meetings. I met Peter Davenport and Larry and Marilyn Childs, and I... I did want to add, parenthetically, a bit of sad news. Uh, Larry Childs passed away last night. He was very elderly. He went peacefully. And he and his wife, Marilyn, devoted many years to MUFON and UFO research. I had to work that in. Well, that, no, that's fine. And I do that is very sad news to, to lose somebody like that. So, so you're now attending the meetings, the, the MUFON meetings. Exactly. And I was promoted rapidly because there was nobody in my area. And because of my law enforcement training, I ended up being a state section director. I uncovered a UFO crash retrieval case down in Westport because after my when I finally sort of came out of the closet and told my fellow officers I was interested in UFOs, uh, after all the kidding and the tinfoil hats and people putting odd cartoons in my locker, etc., everybody kept saying something crashed in the woods by Westport. Well, years later, that developed into a full investigation, and I even wrote a short book about what I learned. It was very interesting. But along the way, I kept investigating more and more cases. I worked with Peter Davenport occasionally. I worked with other people I tried to apply the same skill set that I had from law enforcement to my UFO investigations, which if I had to summarize it very quickly, I would say that the two things that I always told every new policeman, because I ended up training other officers, was that you have to do two things no matter what. You have to act in good faith and you have to do what's reasonable. And you have to keep asking yourself, what would a reasonable person conclude if they were confronted by the evidence that I am being presented with now? And that's really the essence of how I approach investigations. And I, I don't think it should be any different when you try to investigate something as strange and unusual as unidentified flying objects. Well, what I find interesting is uh, when I went into the National Guard after 9-11, Everybody knew my background, which was the UFO thing. And there were no jokes. There were no uh, cat calls. There were people who were interested in the information and where to learn more about UFOs, but there was really nobody making jokes about that. And that, that this would have been in uh, uh, 2002, 2003. So I, you know, kind of an interesting guy, dichotomy there. I did have a, one discussion with the, uh, the first sergeant of the headquarters company, and he, he wanted to know how I felt about being the UFO guy. And he was really into NASCAR and everybody knew it. And I said, well, how do you like being the NASCAR guy? It's kind of the same difference, you know, your personal interests intruding on your military duties, if you will. And uh, he understood exactly what I meant. But there wasn't really any problems. If they had a question about UFOs or something came up about that, they'd come and ask me about it or tell me about it and I'd follow up on it. So that's kind of an interesting difference between part of your pathway and my pathway there. So you've been investigating the UFOs there in Washington state area. Um, and you've been working for MUFON. What was their reaction to the reports you sent in? Uh, very favorable. In fact, I somewhere I still have one of the only accolades that I ever received from my time in MUFON was I had a little p handwritten postcard from Walt Andrus telling me he had heard about the Westport crash and please keep up the good work. And that always meant a lot to me. It, you know, I, I found when you, when you do investigations, it's 
I don't want the boss standing over my shoulder, but it feels good once in a while to have him come by and say, you know, you're doing a good job and I appreciate it. I'm well, 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 well aware of your investigative techniques. I love what you're doing. I don't have to micromanage you to make sure that you do it properly. I'm interested in what you what you found. So Walt Andrus sent you that. Did you publish stuff about um, your investigations in the MUFON Journal? A little bit along the way. This was all sandwiched into my my first marriage, which sadly was unsuccessful, although I got three wonderful children, and eventually I met my current wife, who is the love of my life. But these were very, very busy times. And so I, like a lot of people in MUFON, you squeeze it in where you can. Uh, in your investigations, did you come across many that were uh, misidentifications? You could easily identify it once you did a little bit of work? Oh, I've, I've done the statistical analysis. I actually did a presentation recently on what I've learned from 30 years of UFOs, and I can summarize it very simply. There are 750 cases in the MUFON CMS, although I don't think that CMS is quite complete. What, what, have, exactly, what exactly is the CMS? I'm sorry, the case management system for the mutual UFO network. Okay. And th those are the cases that were assigned to me that I was responsible for. And I would say on the average, out of every 10 cases, eight out of the 10 comprise man-made objects, natural objects, and cases where there is insufficient information to draw a good conclusion, or they, there are a few hoaxes, not really terribly many. And then there are one or two cases out of every 10 that are what I call gold. And a gold case is where you have high witness credibility combined with very high strangeness. In other words, something that's so strange that if you accept that the credibility of the witness, you are confronted with something that can't be explained either naturally or as a man-made object. Well, let me go off on a tangent here, which I'm just, I do periodically. Uh, how, how often did you come up with observations of Venus? Pretty often, as so, well as the space station, of course, is another favorite. Oh, yeah. I've had a few of those. Uh, people call me excited. We just saw this light cross the sky. Yeah, that would be the space station. I, I asked about Venus because I know Venus, when it's closest to Earth and it's its brightest, can really really fool people. And, and I know that we used to always laugh about the Air Force saying, well, it was Venus. And it turns out Venus is the culprit in quite a few cases. So uh, just a little tangent I wanted to go off on. Uh, so you've been you were working with the MUFON organization. You moved up the chain of command. You were a section director, a field investigator. Uh, when did you become the state director? I believe that was somewhere around 2008 or 2009. That was uh, Larry and Marilyn Childs had been in charge. They of course uh, became very elderly. Peter Davenport bought a missile silo in eastern Washington and moved over there because he was basically fed up with Seattle. And the Seattle group kind of drifted apart. And they came, to, Larry and Marilyn came to me one day and asked me if I would take over the directorship. So I did. So uh, it didn't come from the top. It actually came, well, sort of from the top. But I mean, it really came out of the, uh, the, the local organization. They wanted you to take over the, the state directorship. What did, what, and what does all, all that entail? Well, number one, you have to keep up with the constant flow of cases coming in on the case management system. And that can be very nerve wracking because since it's a volunteer organization, managing a volunteer organization is never easy because although you may on paper have uh, 10 investigators, you probably only have one or two that are actually available or willing to work. And then about the time that you get them trained and up to speed, someone moves away, someone quits, someone gets sick, someone gets divorced, and on you go. And it's like uh, herding cats. Well, I, you know, the thing that I find interesting in that comment is as a member of the National Guard, and we were uh, responsible for um, disaster relief and that sort of thing. And one of the things we always planned for was the 
inavailability of, of many of our members simply because they would be involved in the crisis area. They couldn't get to us. And so uh, in our management, we had to encompass that. And yet it's, it wasn't a voluntary organization. It was more mandatory. We could order people to do stuff, but we had to take into account what their personal uh, situation was. So it's it, a little simpler than what you were doing, but something that kind of shows that not all things are easily categorized. So you've got your your director, or your your field investigators, your state section directors. You send them out on investigations, or alert them to it, or they report to you. Correct. And then, of course, you're responsible for their work product, which is very similar to the work that I did as a detective sergeant, where you assign cases, you monitor the progress, you assist where you can, and you ultimately sign off on the finished product and transfer it back into the system, either to be sent to the prosecutor for criminal filing or uh, inactivated and filed for storage. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Apparently, we have a more somber tone going on there, <laughs> given the music. I'm joined with James Clarkson here on A Different Perspective, part of the X-Zone Broadcast Network. And if you get a chance, take a look at the X-Zone Broadcast Network website and look at some of the other fine shows that uh, they have on, on the network. When we went away, we were kind of discussing a little bit about the um, way MUFON works, the inside stuff, I guess. And... We're going to kind of move away from that. Now, I was trying to kind of set up the, the shows. You know, there's a lot of work involved in this, and there's a lot of people who are very interested in it. But, James, you've had a falling out with the MUFON, uh, network, uh, the MUFON network, uh, MUFON organization, and over the last few days you have resigned your position as the state director. What precipitated that? Well, this probably started back in – I should quickly go through the history. Uh, eventually – we ended up in a situation, I believe it was where around 2010 or so, actually when James Carrion was the international director of MUFON, at that time there was a partnership with Bigelow Aerospace to provide funding for investigations. That, of course, is the biggest problem with MUFON or anybody who wants to do this kind of work is where do you get the money and resources to do an investigation? That's a that's a tough nut to crack. The partnership eventually fell apart. There were accusations and counter accusations between James Carrion, the board, and Bigelow Aerospace. The partnership broke up. James Carrion resigned. I believe uh, Clifford Clift became the next director. He was followed by Dave McDonald. And then comes Jan Harzan. Well, the situation with Jan Harzan, he is a very different individual, I think, in the history of MUFON. And to give the man credit where he does deserve it, he is an experienced corporate manager and a businessman. Does he have Does he have a background in UFOs? Was he interested in UFOs? Um, how did he end up coming into MUFON? He do states that he, he... I do. I don't know the details of it, but he apparently had a very profound childhood experience of direct contact with a UFO. I, I've never had the, been able to sit down and hear the entire story. I only know the gist of it. But I believe that that is the reason that he gives for his involvement. And so MUFON, but was he a member of MUFON? I, I, what I don't understand here, and, and it's probably not even necessary, but what I don't understand here is here's this corporate guy, and suddenly he is now the executive director of MUFON. How do we get from corporate guy to MUFON? Well, you have to remember that the way MUFON is organized, there is a autonomous, self-perpetuating board of directors. 
And from an outside viewpoint, even from a state director viewpoint, unless you are one of the, you know, key state directors, a lot of this is like a big black box. And they have people on the board that you may or may not have ever met. You don't know where they come from. You don't know exactly who they're affiliated with. When one of them steps down, they replace themselves. Whenever a the, the main director resigns, they find somebody to fill it. There's no direct input from state directors or the membership at large. So there is a separation there. Then there is another separation because state directorships can probably loosely be defined as haves and have-nots. You have some states usually centered on a large urban area uh, around, you know, Portland, Oregon, or, you know, some big city. And those directorships may develop into a large, fairly permanent organization that's fully staffed. These are the states that have their own mini symposium conferences. They collect dues. They have a budget. They're incorporated. Other states are struggling just to hang on. And, you know, I have to say, unfortunately, when I was a Washington state director, we never got beyond the struggling arena. It, so is, we didn't there, have money. Is there compensation for the state directors? Uh, no, some of the state there, directors? Is, there is no compensation at all to be a state director. And that's one of the criticisms that I have not only levied, but other people have. For instance, when you you are told you must attend the symposium, but when you do, you pay exactly the same amount as anybody else who wanted to attend. In other words, there are no discounts. There's no, there's no anything. Okay, so uh, there's some problems with the organization. There's going to be problems with any organization. What was the final straw for you? What, what made you resign? Actually, it's all your fault, Kevin. Uh, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's my I, mission I, I, to destroy MUFON, I guess. Uh, no, no, I, no, no. I, you did a very... I, I'm saying that in a humorous way, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, your interview of Jan Harzan, I think, is one of the most important interviews that's been done in the field of ufology for many years, and it certainly was for me, because I did not realize what the MUFON inner circle was until after that interview. And all of my alarm bells went off because. I, did you know Jay, about the Did you know about the inner circle before the interview? I kind of did, but I didn't realize the full implications of it. The reason I say is I kind of. I joined Mufon in 1987. My service was continuous up until 2011. I was gone for a year because I had a confrontation with the director of investigations, whose name was Marie Malzahn who had not risen from the ranks. She had made a large cash donation. She ended up being appointed as the director of investigations. And she basically ordered me around and told me that I would either obey her or else. And I chose the or else. So <laughs> I'm not sure in a volunteer organization, that's the best uh, leadership strategy. You will do what I say or else. Yeah, catch you later, pal. Exactly, because, and, and, well, I think that in any organization, communication skills are imperative. It's much better to get people's cooperation than it is to start. If you have to start ordering people around, you've already lost part of the battle. So that's that's part of the part of the reason. But what and and the uh, interview, to, the interview that I did with Harzan kind of led to it. What what what, what was a final straw here? Jay Z Knight, Ramtha, uh, and, that. I live about I live across the county from Jay Z Knight's world headquarters, which is in Yelm, Washington. I'm on the other side of Thurston County in Washington State. So you know who she is? I know very well who she is. And I of course can't help but read all the local news stories, hear hear all the local stories about she is a very rich and very powerful person. And trying to be fair to her, she does attract people from all over the world, come to Yelm, Washington, to be in her presence, and they pay a lot of money to do that. And she claims, of course, that she is channeling a warrior named Ramtha from 
I don't know, 30,000 years ago or something. And she quotes all of this alleged wisdom. And in one particular instance, I guess there was a, a local woman who had taken some of the training from her and then went out and taught a couple of classes. This is, you know, from what I could tell, this is basic new age philosophy that anybody could get in five minutes on the internet. But Jay-Z Knight felt that this was proprietary information and she could afford a an armada of lawyers and they went after this poor woman and basically economically destroyed her. And well, it let's, was let's, very let's, cruel. Let's, let's make one thing straight here. Jay-Z Knight is a member of the MUFON Inner Circle, which according to Jan Harzon is merely a donation level and really has no influence on the daily operations of MUFON. Even though on the MUFON website, it talks about the inner circle. It talks about uh, guiding the organization and that sort of thing. So Jay-Z Knight is on the inner circle of MUFON. She gains that position by paying $5,000 a year for that position. And you're saying here that, that Jay-Z Knight, of course, economically destroyed this poor woman because she was teaching some new age philosophy that, that Jay-Z Knight thought was proprietary. That's correct. And the, the you know, I can't, you know, do I know that Jay-Z Knight is influencing day-to-day -day MUFON policy? No, I have no direct knowledge of that. But I, I've been around the block enough to know that uh, money has a lot of influence. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything has strings attached. And I also know that in the past, key people have been promoted from the inner circle. They have been selected and put in positions of authority. Marie Malzahn was one. Some of the other people on the inner circle, Dave McDonald, for instance, has been the international director. So I think there's more to the inner circle than just being a, you know, a cool little club where you get perks. This is a place where, you know, they can recruit people for key positions. These are the movers and the shakers. And in fact, there was a, another controversy which kind of led indirectly to my resignation was the John Ventry uh, debacle over his, shall we say, rather unfortunate things he said on Facebook that got a lot of people infuriated and were, I think, a very bad – I'm not even commenting on what he said. His selection of topics was extremely inappropriate considering that everybody associated his name with MUFON. But even he is still on the inner circle. I mean, this whole thing is very confusing. And then we add in this current symposium that just got over and the selection of speakers. And quite frankly, then we add on top of that a lot of progressive burnout on my part. I had just reached the point where I felt like I was doing more and more work and getting less and less appreciation and you reach what you call the Popeye point. That's all I can stand because I can't stand no more. And that's basically the point that I reached. I don't believe that the MUFON that exists now is the MUFON that I joined. I feel like the voices of the people who are serious UFO investigators, they're still there. There are many very, very good people in MUFON that are trying very hard to do investigations with integrity. But commercialism has won the day. And I can't even tell you that that's wrong. You know, Jan Harzan may be exactly what MUFON needs in order to survive. I can't tell you that. I can only tell you that he and I have a fundamental difference in philosophy. Because my impression from the interview that you did with him, and my impression from things that he has said, is that he doesn't get it. He would not understand how worried I am and other state directors are about having people like Jay-Z Knight in the inner circle. He, would not, he, he doesn't see any problem with that. Well, the, the one thing you said was interesting. The state directors are required to go to the symposium and they're required to pay the... This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, 
Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. It's always necessary for us to say we're back, even though it's obviously that we are. I don't know why. I watch news programs. I watch all kinds of stuff, and they always say we are back. So we are back. I'm joined by James Clarkson. We're talking about MUFON and his reasons for resigning as the state section. I'm sorry, the state director. I keep wanting to say state section director because it's more alliterative, I guess. Uh, James Clarkson was the former Washington state director. He just recently quit. Did you go to the symposium or did you did you resign prior to that? I resigned prior to the symposium. Quite frankly, I couldn't see any point in going to listen to those speakers with the possible exception of Richard Dolan. So you found these lineup of speakers to be inadequate, uh, that they weren't really representing the UFO field? Well, it's, it's deeper than that, and I would hardly use the adjective inadequate. The problem I have in particular, let's just focus on Corey Good, who is probably the most famous of all of the people who were presenting. And the problem was analyzed very thoroughly by Richard Dolan, who broke it down, but it's plain to see that if you tell people that you have had this career in the galactic army or the secret space program or whatever you want to call it, and you were whisked away in time and you did a 20-year career and then you were whisked back to moments after you left so that no one you knew actually knew what you had endured, you've got the perfect story because there's no evidence. Now, can I tell you for sure that that didn't happen or that it's impossible? No, I can't say that. Well, let me let me break in here and say I can. It's impossible. The story is complete and utter crap. Thank but you. Th- that's just my opinion. So well, you're the uh, host and I didn't want to overstep my bounds. <laughs> so you were not thrilled with the uh, the lineup of the speakers. It seemed to be more directed at those who would uh, uh, draw in a lot of people to spend their money at MUFON than it was on presenting a program that was based in reality. Correct. And, and actually, in fairness, I have to say that from a business point of view, uh, Jan Harzan and company correctly assessed the times that we live in because apparently the attendance was stellar, which is kind of sad. But I think that's, you know, people want to be stimulated. They want something thrilling or titillating. They don't want to think about what they're viewing. I know you can't answer this question, but it just popped into my mind. How many of the people attending that really bought the story? Or are they just treating it as a great science fiction tale and it's fun to watch this guy talk? Well, I can tell you, I, I, I have been receiving a deluge of email And because I was in MUFON for quite a while, even though I'm out, I still have a lot of contacts. I've been receiving information that apparently the most sensational of these speakers, there was Corey Good and one other one, but apparently they got the most, uh, right after they presented, they, they were mobbed by people who wanted to come up and talk to them about what they had presented. So apparently this is extremely popular. So what I should do then, 
because I've been accused actually of being part of a space force that we didn't go to Iraq. We have been brainwashed. We really were involved in a fight on Mars and other planets. I should embrace that concept and start telling everybody, yeah, it's all true. And then I would be one of the stellar uh, speakers at one of these conferences. Yep. Okay, and and that is that kind of the state of ufology today that the the, the uh, these outrageous claims are much more important than actual research into UFOs. Unfortunately, I believe that that's true. We are we I I can't help but think that ufology is reflective of society at large. And let's face it, we are all overstimulated by social media, television, advertising. Everybody is pitching something. Everybody is trying to get your attention. Buy this, take that, do this, do that. Believe me, don't believe him. And it goes on and on. So if you're going to rise to the top and you want to get people's attention, you almost get forced into this mold of, well, I have to tell a more outrageous story. So what you're doing actually is condemning me for saying to people, buy my book, Roswell in the 21st Century. No, because that's honest. <laughs> that I tell was a little humor. <laughs> I know. I tell people to buy my book on June Crane. Um, but, but I think that's very honest. I don't think we have any – we're not trying to deceive people when we say that. Well, I've always said what I should do is put on my uniform, go to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, have my picture taken outside of the ATEC building and say, yeah, I was just inside and saw the bodies. What's the big deal? I think you could probably get – if they still had the Hangar 1 program going, I think you would now be a – would have a whole episode to yourself if you did that. Well, just so you know, I did uh, miss an opportunity to be on Ancient Aliens. I I, uh, I missed my opportunity there. I dodged a bullet on that one. So there we go. So I, your, your um, I guess, annoyance with the MUFON leadership, uh, the direction the organization is going, and some of the other things is the reason that you resigned in the last couple of weeks. Correct. It was all precipitated by the John Ventry scandal. Uh, then actually Rich Hoffman quit. That's an interesting story because he was in MUFON when it started in 1969. He has always been a pillar of MUFON. He was a state director. He was one of the people who donated generously of time and money to MUFON over the, over the years. He was, uh, I don't know the man terribly well, but my impression was that, you know, he was somebody that everybody liked and respected. And all at once he said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I immediately queried him and said, what's going on? And he said, I, I can't fight with Jan Harzan and Steve Hudgens anymore over trying to make life easier for the state directors and the field investigators. They don't listen to me. They won't do anything I ask them to do. And he says, I just can't do it anymore. And that was about the time the John Ventry scandal was going. I kept waiting for Jan Harzan to step up and say, you know, Mr. Ventry, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not going to do it under the banner of MUFON. But instead, we waited and waited and nothing happened. And about that time, I thought, you know, I've had all I can take. I can't do this. So I guess everything kind of came to a head when John Ventry did his racist rant on Facebook. Yes, it was kind of like the perfect storm. And then the other day after I had sent in my resignation, and I, I freely admit I tried to go up. Initially, I was trying to go out very quietly, but it just having somebody after you've been in an organization for 29 years and all they say is thank you for your service and you realize that when you finish that conversation, you're about to fade into oblivion, that wasn't acceptable for me. So I wrote down what I really felt about leaving MUFON, and I decided I would go out in a blaze of glory. But then right after I finished that, I opened my email, and here's Robert Powell resigning from the head of science and research. I, had not, heard, I had not heard that. Robert well, Powell I, I wrote a whole article about this, which I certainly will give you the link to it. It's everywhere. It's on my website under the, in the I, blog. I, 
I've seen that. I've seen that. I, I guess I didn't make the connection. I didn't make the connection. That's what it's all about. Robert Powell, who is basically a, uh, a he has been a pillar in MUFON. He's a workhorse, a, a man who is always there to work on projects, trying to give a scientific perspective to things as much as you can in ufology. And suddenly he's saying, I tried to persuade Jan Harzan and the board that their selection of speakers for the symposium was not a good one and that this was a bad course for MUFON. And he said, they won't even listen to me. And he said, I've, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. So I think what you're saying here is MUFON's direction right now is, um, I guess, to, to promote the survival of MUFON by bringing money in from whatever source you possibly can, regardless of that source. What's more important than the scientific integrity is the financial windfalls. Yes, I believe that, that is an, it is a completely correct statement, and I would say I agree with what you've just said 100%. Okay. Well, we're really right up against it once again, James. Want to thank you for showing up today and kind of uh, enlightening on some of the inner workings of MUFON that I wasn't aware of in some of the directions. I find it interesting that in the last uh, few weeks, there's been an exodus of people from the MUFON organization, not just because of John Ventry, but uh, other aspects of it, like the symposium speaker program. So I guess we'll have to keep an eye on MUFON and see where it's going um, in the next few few years. But you're you're completely out now, right? I am completely out of MUFON, but I am by no means out of the UFO mystery. I'm working on my own investigations. I'm going to help anybody that I can, and who knows? Maybe one of us will be lucky enough to unravel some of these mysteries. Okay, well, James, your uh, website is jamesclarksonufo.com. Uh, you can find it there. You can get uh, find his email address. You can uh, email him if you have questions or you want to make comments.